sleeping in a motel in Brewer, Maine one night. I woke up with terrible hay fever and my eyes were burning and I looked out of the river and there were great mounds of white foam going right down the river. And the next morning I got up and I said, my God, what was that happening last night? He said, oh, that's just the river. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, look, every night the paper company send the stuff down the river. I said, what are you talking about? And he said, don't you understand? That's how we get rid of the effluent from the paper mills. Well, I knew at that time, I'd been in a business, I'd sold um, oil to the paper mills, I knew all the owners, I'd been in politics, I knew the people in the towns. I knew not one constituent of the paper mills wanted to have the river polluted. And yet here the river was being polluted. And it was more or less as if we created a doom machine. In our search for wealth and, and for prosperity, we created something that was going to destroy us. The traders who are involved in the market are not guys whose moral fiber when it comes to environmental conditions are gonna be, be rattled at all. They're seeing dollars and they're making money. There are no markets that uh, you will not trade because of you know how you feel about it, no. Brokers don't stay away from copper because it, it violates their religious beliefs or their environmental policies, no. There are times when you think about it, but it's fleeting. <laughs> it really is a fleeting moment. It's like, you know, yeah, oh yeah, well, the town being polluted down there in Peru, but uh, hey, this guy needs to buy some copper. and getting paid a commission too. If we were more, you know, educated on what's really going on in third world countries with the production of these things, then obviously I think, you know, there might be, you know, a, a bigger movement. Uh, there might be more of a, uh, you know, moral struggle but right now, we, we don't know. Our information that we receive does not include anything about the environmental conditions. Because un until the environmental conditions become a commodity themselves or being traded, then obviously we will not have anything to do with that. It doesn't come into our psyche at all. If suddenly we have clean air is now a commodity, then of course, hey, they're polluting it down in Peru, that one is going down. There's a difference. But as it stands right now, that's not uh, yet a factor. It's not yet become a commodity, so we're not thinking about that, and we don't have any, you know, any reason to, because it's, it, it you know, it, it's so far away, and it's, it, you hardly hear anything about it. I mean, keep in mind, I mean, there are things going on right in our backyard, for God's sake. We trade live hogs. I mean, there's so many pigs in the state of Carolina, and it's polluting the rivers, but how often do you find out about that? At Multinational Monitor, we put together a list of the top corporate criminals of the 1990s. We went back and looked at all of the criminal fines that corporations had paid in the decade. Exxon pled guilty in connection to federal criminal charges with the Valdez spill and paid $125 million in criminal fines. General Electric was guilty of defrauding the federal government and paid $9.5 million in criminal fines. Chevron was guilty of environmental violations and paid $6.5 million in Mitsubishi fines. Mitsubishi was guilty of antitrust violations and paid $1.8 million IBM in fines. IBM was guilty of illegal exports and paid $8.5 million was guilty in criminal of fines. environmental violations. Pfizer, the drug manufacturer, was guilty of antitrust Odwala violations and paid was guilty $20 million of food and drug regulatory violations. Sears was guilty of financial fraud. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois was guilty of fraud. Of fraud. And environmental and violations. Was guilty of Georgia Korean Airlines guilty of financial fraud. 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 Guilty of an antitrust violation. Paid $500 million in criminal fines. Again and again, we have the problem that whether you obey the law or not is a matter whether it's cost effective. If the chance of getting caught and the penalty are less than it costs to comply, uh, people think of it as being just a business decision. I'm drawing the metaphor of the early attempts to fly. The man going off of a very high cliff in his airplane with the wings flapping and the guy is flapping the wings and the wind is in his face and this poor fool thinks he's flying but in fact he's in free fall and he just doesn't know it yet because the ground is so far away. 
but of course the craft is doomed to crash. That's the way our civilization is. The very high cliff represents the virtually unlimited resources we seem to have when we began this journey. The craft isn't flying because it's not built according to the laws of aerodynamics, and it's subject to the law of gravity. Our civilization is not flying because it's not built according to the laws of aerodynamics for civilizations that would fly. And of course, the ground is still a long way away, but some people have seen that ground rushing up sooner than the rest of us have. The visionaries have seen it and have told us it's coming. There's not a single scientific peer-reviewed paper published in the last 25 years that would contradict this scenario. Every living system of Earth is in decline. Every life support system of Earth is in decline. And these together constitute the biosphere the biosphere that supports and nurtures all of life, and not just our life, but perhaps 30 million other species that share this planet with us. The typical company of the 20th century, extractive, wasteful, abusive, linear in all of its processes, taking from the earth, making, wasting, sending its products back to the biosphere, waste to a landfill. I myself was amazed to learn just how much stuff the Earth has to produce through our extraction process to produce a dollar of revenue for our company. When I learned, I was flabbergasted. We're leaving a terrible legacy of poison and diminishment of the environment for our grandchildren's grandchildren. Generations not yet born. Some people have called that intergenerational tyranny, a form of taxation without representation levied by us some generations yet to be. It's the wrong thing to do. One of the questions that comes up periodically is to what extent could a corporation be uh, considered to be a, a psychopathic? And if we look at a corporation as a legal person, that it may not be that difficult to actually draw the transition between psychopathy in the individual to psychopathy in, in a corporation. We can go through the characteristics that define this particular disorder uh, one by one and see how they might apply to corporations. They would have all the characteristics. And in fact, in many respects, corporation of that sort is a prototypical psychopath. If the dominant institution of our time has been created in the image of a psychopath, who bears the moral responsibility for its actions? Can a building have moral opinions? Can a building have social responsibility? If a building can't have social responsibility, what does it mean to say that a corporation can? A corporation is simply an artificial legal structure. But the people who are engaged in it, whether the stockholders, whether the executives in it, whether the employees, they all have moral responsibilities. It's a fair assumption that every human being real human beings, flesh and blood ones, not corporations. But every flesh and blood human being is a moral person. You know, we've got the same genes, we're more or less the same. Uh, but our, uh, you know, our nature, the nature of humans, allows all kinds of behavior. I mean, I, every one of us under some circumstances could be, uh, you know, a, a gas chamber attendant and a saint. You know, depends on all sorts of things. If you're working in a for-profit company uh, in the Anglo-American system of capitalism, your principal